From 1963 to 1976, he played 184 games in goal for the Rangers, and he wore both number one and number 30. He shared the Vezina Trophy with Eddie Jockerman in 1971. A stellar season for the Ranger goaltending combination. Here is Gilles Villamure. of honor, the man whose jersey number one will be permanently retired this evening. 539 games as a Ranger goalie from 1965 to 1976, five times an NHL All-Star, winner of the Vezina Trophy in 1971, elected to the Hockey Hall of Fame in 1987, number one, Eddie Jockerman. And now, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, a special hello goes out to the director of media for the Boston Bruins alumni. It's the Mark Boyer, and I see you, Marky. Welcome to the Pro Hockey Alumni Podcast, the voice of hockey legends. This is the classic hockey show for classic hockey fans. We celebrate the history of the game with stories told by the select few who actually lived it. Get ready for an all-access pass to the heart of the hockey universe. Episode 59 of the Pro Hockey Alumni Podcast looks back at the great New York Ranger goalies of the 1960s and 70s, and we have an overtime session featuring classic hockey news and notes. Today's guest is author and New York Rangers historian George Grimm, whose outstanding new book, Guardians of the Goal, is a comprehensive guide to everyone who's ever played goal for the New York Rangers. The book is a must-read for hockey fans, and although this book is painstakingly researched, it is also entertaining and fast-paced. I learned a lot reading Guardians of the Goal, and you will too. I highly recommend it. In our discussion, we focus on Ranger goalies of the 60s and 70s like Gilles Villemure, Ed Jacobin, John Davidson, and more. We also sneak in a great Vaclav Dynamensky story as well. Guardians of the Gold is available on Amazon.com. The link is in the show notes. Now, as many of you know, in addition to the PHA social media sites, we also have other popular classic hockey Facebook sites. They include Hartford Whaler Nation, the Boston Bruins alumni, and WHA Hockey. Now and then, I'll take a look back at the past week on all these sites and pick out highlights to discuss on the show. On this episode, we'll remember two wild WHA Thanksgiving stories from Birmingham, Alabama, featuring Whalers coach Harry Neal in 1976 and the Cincinnati Stingers in 1977 as they found the Birmingham Bulls and their fans to be inhospitable Turkey Day hosts. We'll also discuss some interesting details of Bobby Orr's final game as a Boston Bruin this week in 1975. And finally, we'll take a look back at the hockey life of NHL alum Bill McCreary Sr., who passed away this week at the age of 84. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on iTunes. This helps make the show more visible to hockey fans around the world. I greatly appreciate your feedback, comments, and suggestions. Home base for the show is ProHockeyAlumni.com. Org. Now, let's talk classic hockey with George Grimm. We're back on the show with a repeat guest author and New York Rangers historian George Grimm. And he's authored a tremendous book. And if you're a hockey fan, as I said in the open, strongly recommend this book called Guardians of the Goal. And it's a complete guide to New York Rangers goaltenders, even 
goaltenders who didn't even play for the team who were practice goaltenders like writer Frank Brown had no idea but nonetheless it's, it's a comprehensive very interesting book that talks not just about the goaltenders but about a lot of things that were happening around the times they were playing and it's a real complete history of the Rangers goaltenders like it probably has never been written and it's extraordinarily well researched and well written it moves along quickly you'll enjoy it but that's a long way of saying welcome to our guest George Grimm all right Mark thanks for having me on well, we, as I said, uh, prior to the show, I recently went to Madison Square Garden with the Boston Bruins alumni, and I got this book right after that time period. So I was really in a New York state of mind, so to speak. Right. And we uh, jumped into the book, and as I said, it was uh, certainly uh, exceeded all expectations. First of all, I love the cover. Henry Lundquist on the cover, that beautiful panoramic shot from inside the goal at Madison Square Garden, iconic shot. And I was curious, when you're producing a book like that, to be able to use a photo like that, uh, what process do you have to go through to get rights to do that? Uh, well, you know, pictures are hard to get uh, because everything is owned by Getty Images, and uh, it's very, very uh, expensive. Um, this was uh, this was actually... Uh, uh, loaned to me by the publisher. I had uh, something like that in mind. I actually picked one out, and um, the publisher said they didn't have rights to the one I wanted, but this is, this is you know, almost the same picture. You know, I wanted something from inside the goal, you know, back in the goal with the, um, with the guard and um, the ceiling in it, you know, mm-hmm. so you could see where, where uh, they were. You can't mistake that. You know, when I went to the garden, I was talking to a security guard uh, prior to our game uh, down by the uh, uh, the bench area. And he said, right. hey, why don't I take your picture? And I said, well, sure, go ahead. And yeah, he knew enough to he get down on one knee and took the uh, bottom to top shot with the back with the ceiling in the background. And, of course, yeah. you can't miss the, uh, the world's most famous arena uh, right. with, with that shot, to be sure. One thing I have to tell you, and I was a... For, for, for my entire life, really. But when I was especially a young kid, and I would read a lot of hockey books. A lot of them kind of emanated from those New York writers. We had Hal Bach, who you t- talked to recently. Right. And, uh, right. of course, Stan and Shirley Fischler. But I noticed that the forward of the book was by none other than Stan Fischler, perhaps right. the greatest hockey writer of all time. And I was I'm curious... I very lucky to get that, yeah. Yeah, and I was curious how that all transpired. Um, well, um, he... Um, uh, the other book, you know, that I wrote, uh, we did everything but win. He, um, you know, actually really liked that book, and uh, he's he's been pushing it for me. And uh, I asked him if he would do the forward for this, and he said yes. So, you know, who knew? Yeah, he, so, sometimes that's uh, all you have to do is ask. And the good thing is, he, right. he he read your that previous right. book, and that was an awesome book too. And that says a lot for you and a lot of uh, credibility right off the bat by having Stan contribute. Yeah, sure. I wanted to and take... even Frank Brown there, you know, uh, the essay by uh, by uh, Frank Brown, because he was um, an uh, after-practice goalie is what he called himself. That was he fascinating. Was I had no yeah, idea. He would go out there and uh, play goal while, you know, if anybody wanted to shoot more than, you know, than you know, the actual practice. And um, he, he uh, uh, you know, wrote about how, how the players tried to... Um, to try to uh, intimidate him and uh, <laughs> you know scare him, but he stood in there and you know he you know he did well. Right. Well, he enjoyed it. Frank, uh, recent addition to the media wing of the Hockey Hall of Fame and a future right. guest on our show. He and I have been in contact, and I had no idea. And I'm so glad I found this in the book because I would have been left unprepared. I had no idea that he had that experience and what a thrill that was, uh, sure. just to say the least. I want to take one quick diversion for our fans here because of the timing of it. Today, this is not a goalie question, but today uh, I saw your recent retro Rangers column about Vaclav Nedovansky. And he's a recent inductee into the Hockey Hall of Fame. Some controversy from some fans about that. Now, what I wanted to say, and I think you've noted it, he was probably, he was considered to be one of the top one or two players in Europe during his heyday in the 60s and early 70s. So a lot of the uh, accomplishments he had in his career prior to coming over to North America 
And he was okay. always regarded as like the Phil Esposito of Eastern Europe hockey, six foot two at a time when, you know, that was real big for players. And yeah. of course, went over to the World Hockey Association with the Toronto Toros. By the time he got back to the NHL, he was still pretty productive, but he was not a elite superstar. But nonetheless, right. told that story because you know what? I, I back in the eighties, I had this conversation with Emil Francis, and you brought it back to life in the story about he, he, having Steve Berklesich, who's a scout of New York, mm -hmm. uh, backing up to a. Uh, Having a, a a hideaway in a farm somewhere, backing up to a, yeah. a, a Saskatchewan yeah. rink, and it was just a fascinating story. I had forgotten all about it, and then I, I read your recount. Could you just give the fans like a, just a little synopsis of that uh, cloak and dagger uh, Netamansky story? Yeah, well, the Rangers were all set to kind of you know smuggle him out of town. Um, he had come over with the uh, Czechoslovakian team to play the Montreal Junior team, I think, and. Um, the Rangers had contacted him through uh, a friend of Emil Francis who spoke, uh, you know, Czechoslovakian, and they had it all arranged that after the after the game was over, he was going to get dressed and go right out the back door and get in the car, <laughs> and they're going to drive him to this uh, this uh, farmhouse, you know. And um, somehow the uh, the uh, authorities got wind of it, and they and uh, he didn't play last, uh, you know, that night, and he had two guards standing on either side of him, and they were. <laughs> You're going to let him out of their sight, and so the whole thing, you know, didn't happen. But uh, but, you know, had the Rangers been able to get him then, you know, things might change a little bit. They would have had a big center, that's for sure, and um, they might have won some more games and won some more playoff games, and who knows? But it just wasn't meant to be. And you know, they did get him a few years later mm -hmm. in the '80s, but. Um, through some kind of clerical error, after his first game, they had to put him uh, on waivers, and he was claimed by Emil Francis, who was then this, the uh, general manager of the St. Louis Blues, and he played a few games for them, and then he um, was traded back to the Rangers for uh, with Glenn Hamlin right. for uh, Andre Dory, I think, and. Um, so, but that's but that's you know how they tried to get him, and it just didn't work out. So, talking going back to the goaltenders, and again, as uh, I, I noted earlier, we could spend about three hours talking about great Ranger goaltenders, compelling stories, and I've decided to pick it up kind of in in my era and. One goaltender who I thought you did a tremendous job capsulizing his career was Eddie Jockerman from the. Uh, but just talk a little bit about Eddie Jockerman. Some of the obstacles. This was not a slam dunk uh, NHL prospect as a, as a young player coming up. Spent a lot of years in Providence uh, before he became a Hall of Fame goaltender. Uh, things could have gone either way for him. And I, a couple of things that I. It really stood out for me. You, you talked a little bit about Rangers, you know, the Rangers fans were really on his case at the beginning and throwing trash at him at, at, yeah. at, at one point. And I want to see how that dovetails into the Cesar Maniago story as well, which I thought was really interesting. How yeah. uh, uh, he was injured and Cat became frustrated with him, and Eddie Jockman had a, a, an opportunity that way too. But I'm being long winded. Just uh, if you could tell us a little bit about Eddie Jockman. Well, Eddie. Um Eddie um, uh, played uh, you know beer league hockey uh, when he was young, and uh, the uh, Washington Lions, I think, of the Eastern Hockey League, uh, at the end of one of their seasons, they needed a uh, goaltender, and they wanted Eddie's brother Roley, and uh, he didn't want to leave his uh, his uh, job at the time, so he sent Eddie in his place, and um, Eddie went down there and played well. And the next year, he was supposed to play for uh, Providence Reds. And over the summer, he had a kitchen fire, and he burned his legs very badly. And uh, they were saying he would never play again. But Eddie, Eddie, you know, rehabbed, and he would get to the rink for a training camp, you know, hours before the rest of the team. And the trainer, who was named uh, George Army, mm -hmm. would come and help him wrap his legs up and... Um, you know, and you know, help him into his, his pads and everything and just, you know, um, help him. And then he uh, he uh, bounced around the uh, Eastern League for uh, 
a year or so, and then he then he uh, moved to Providence. He did very well in Providence for quite a while. He was uh, scouted by the Rangers and the uh, Detroit Red Wings, and the Rangers got him for uh, Marcel Pai and a bunch of other guys who the owner of the the uh, Reds, Lou, Lou uh, Perry, I think, mm-hmm. right. he wanted uh, only players who were good-looking. He, he, he asked for pictures of all the players because he wanted to bring in you know, young girls, and um, he wanted pictures of all the of all the players he was going to trade for. So, and then Eddie came here, and um, that was right when uh, Jacques Plante uh, retired, and um, Emil also brought in Cesar Maniago and uh, Don Simmons as insurance, and Eddie didn't do so well in his first year, and uh, and. Uh, I don't think Maniago did that well either, but they had the Rangers in front of them, and, and uh, it, you know, and and any and you know, the Rangers weren't a very good team back then anyway. So you know, any goalie would have you know not played well. Mm-hmm. And then in his um, in the the uh, year after that, Maniago was probably going to get the job because he was playing better. He was probably going to get the number one job. But one game against the Bruins uh, early in the year. Uh, Maniago stopped a shot by, I think, Johnny McKenzie on his chin, and he had to go get uh, sewn up, and uh, Eddie went in. And uh, Eddie had had a bad night the game before. He had given up uh, the tying goal and the winning goal in the last few seconds of the game, and, um, you know, the fans, you know, really didn't care for Eddie at that time. And um, and uh, Maniago went in and got stitched up, and uh, Emil said, well, you know, go back in. And, and he didn't want to. He was still hurting, he said, and mm-hmm. he didn't think he should go back in. So Eddie went in. Uh, there he, he gave up the tying and the winning goal again to the Bruins in, in the last minutes of the game, and the fans threw garbage at him. They threw, they threw anything they could get their hands on at him. And um, the next day, um, Emil wanted to... Uh, Go over the uh, the end of the game with the players on tape on film because mm-hmm. you know they filmed all the games back then, and they put the the film in the uh, projector and it caught on fire. So, <laughs> right. so so he had to you know explain you know verbally what happened, and then he got to the goalies and he he uh, he uh, you know, raised hell at Maniago saying you know we're all in this in this as a team. And uh, I don't see why you couldn't go back in. Now, now, Emil Francis had played for many years, and he had played with broken noses and dislocated shoulders and stitches, and he was a tough guy. Mm-hmm. And he went back in, and Maniago wouldn't go back in. So um, um, he said that, you know, um, that uh, that the Eddie's going to be my number one goalie from that here on in. And from that point on, Eddie had a terrific season. He and and he he played I think um most of the games th- through the rest of the season and he was in goal for every every win that the Rangers had that year. They made the playoffs for the first time in uh maybe five years. They mm-hmm. lost to Montreal but um that's how Eddie got to be Eddie Jackman. That's how he he won the fans over and you know, they never threw garbage at him again. No, they sure didn't. In fact, uh, quite to the contrary, one of the most popular Ranger players yeah. of all time. You know, it, it, during that time period, making a brief stop in 69-70 was another Hall of Fame goal, turning one of the greatest of all time, Terry Sawchuk. And, of course, he, his story of his passing that year is something that these days would dominate every news cycle right. across the world. An incredible the tragic turn of events, completely unnecessary. Can you give us a, uh, a kind of a capsule of, of that terrible night and, and week in Ranger history? Um, it was after the season, and uh, Ron Stewart and uh, Terry Sorcher grew together out in Long Island because the Rangers all lived out in Long Island at the time you know, during the season. And uh, they had been drinking, and they got into a fight, and... Um, um, Sawchuck fell over uh, Stewart, and he either fell on his knee or he fell on the on a barbecue uh, on the lawn, and he ruptured his spleen. And um, he 
he uh you know they they rushed into the hospital it, it, they had to uh have uh, multiple operations on him to uh to repair the uh, damage to his spleen but they didn't get it all and a few days later he died mm-hmm. and um it was a shame and you know Emil explained the whole thing to me in the book and how he had to go down to the morgue and claim the body and uh it was really sad it was really cuz you know Terry Sorchuk was one of the greatest goaltenders of his time. In fact, he was picked number the, the uh, number one goalie by the Hockey News a few years ago. Right. Well, the story of the cat going to the morgue was really compelling, uh, very personal, and you could, right. as he said, the bodies were lined up like like hockey bags you'd have hockey sticks in. Right. right. And it was always yeah. so cold and so callous when he walked in there. It was really uh, yeah disarming for him, but. When you th- going back to Ed Jockman, of course, if you are an aficionado of Rangers hockey from that era, when you think of Ed Jockman, you think of Gilles Villemure. And, you know, I recently had a discussion with Gary Suitcase Smith, and I talked a little bit about his uh, time in Chicago where he shared time with Tony Esposito. And right. when you're sharing time as, as goaltenders, it could be dicey sometimes because you know I, Phil Meir I had the same conversation with he and Dan Bouchard they're both competitive they both want to play but this combination of Villemeur and Jockerman as you know in the book really they, they started to accept their their roles one was left handed one was right handed it kind of right. worked to that right. advantage but talk a little bit about Gilles Villemeur and his impact and the way he teamed with Ed Jockerman well, Gilles was a very good goalie. He he probably could have been the number one goalie anywhere in the league. He he was down in the minor leagues, and he was uh, the best goaltender outside of the NHL for quite a few years. Mm-hmm. Um, he was a very good goalie. He was, you know, he he would catch with his right hand, and Eddie would catch with his left hand. And and Gilles actually did um, well against the Blackhawks. Eddie Jockman didn't have a good record against the Blackhawks, and Gilles did. So. Um, and uh, Gilles, uh, Gilles uh, grew up uh, right near a uh, a uh, racetrack, uh, you know, horse racetrack, mm-hmm. and, a, and a hockey rink. So he had uh, <laughs> right. you know, interest uh, in both, and he used to he used to uh, race harness um, harness races during the off season um, all around the metro area, and. Um, the only thing I couldn't get out of Gilles was who made that mask. Now, he's got that famous, uh, iconic mask, mm-hmm. and um, Gilles didn't remember. And um, that's a shame, because that it, you know, would have been you know, really nice to know who made that mask. But he, he didn't remember. Well, at least he wasn't willing to tell anybody. So, um, But um, uh, when I interviewed him, he was a very nice man, very humble um, very very nice man. Uh, the um, the uh, thing with uh, with uh, Terry Sorcek, if I can just get back to that a minute, the uh, in uh, the early 1960s when the Leafs were winning Stanley Cups, they were associated with Johnny Bauer, uh, Terry Sorcek, Don Simmons, and Bruce Gamble as as the goaltenders. You know, mm-hmm. off and on, Simmons and Gamble were backups, and you know, whenever the other two weren't played, they would play. But all those four once played for the Rangers. And that's uh, you know, fascinating. It is when you, know, you yeah, when you that, go through this entire book and you see the uh, lineup of Hall of Famers who either stopped by briefly or guys like Gump Worsley yeah. who had some significant stretches and Jacques Plante and Sawchuck. It's pretty pretty impressive. Mm-hmm. Again, that makes the book even all that much more special because there are a lot of goaltenders who a lot of people can relate to if you're from as you know if you're from toronto yeah. there's a lot of uh people you're familiar with there too and to, and to be able to get a a capsule of their time in new york i found yeah. to be very very interesting uh, one one goaltender george that is not a big name but i have to give the cat credit for this one because this ends up being you you talk about it in the book an incredible set of circumstances where peter mcduff is traded to the St. Louis Blues and in return for a number one draft pick, which ends up being Steve Vickers. I guess the Blues had the ability to take that player back at the end of the season if they chose to. However, they became fascinated with the notorious Steve Durbano. 
And then right. in the middle of all that, Kurt Bennett shows up. But can you explain that great deal that uh, the cat made with the St. Louis Blues? Yeah, well, you know, at that time, they had uh, um, you know, three goalies. They had uh, Gilles, Eddie, and uh, and uh, Peter McDuff. And he wanted to trade uh, uh, McDuff, and he wanted to get a first-round draft pick for him. And the only place he could get one was from St. Louis. I mean, Emil used to trade a lot with St. Louis. He he kind of thought of them as his his extra farm club. He would he would trade players there, and you know, with the uh, agreement that if they're going to trade him somewhere else, they had to ask him first to see if he wants him back. So, um, uh, you know, that was his deal with them. And uh, so, I guess they kind of did the same thing back to him because they said, "We'll take uh, McDuff, and you you take our first round draft pick," which he turned into a Steve Vickers. And they said at the end of this next season, if we don't want uh, uh, McDuff, uh, we get to send him back to you, and we get the player you used uh, that you picked uh, with our uh, our pick, mm-hmm. our draft pick, and that turned out to be Vickers. And at the end of the year, um, I guess they wanted to have uh, uh, Vickers back, and they said the only way we would not take Vickers back is if we bring in if you give us uh, um the uh, what's uh Durbeno. yeah and uh, you know, at the time you know he was he was you know not well thought of in the Ranger organization but you know Amel held out the Amel said oh I can't do that they'll shoot me in uh, New York because he's just what we need big tough guy you know mm-hmm. And then, you know, I'll get back to you in 24 hours. So Emil got back to them, and he, he thought about it, and he got back to them. And he asked for, uh, he asked for um, Kurt Bennett, and he asked for money. And uh, he made it, you know, out, out uh, pretty good because he got uh, McDuff back, and he got uh, to keep Vickers, and he got uh, Kurt Bennett and some money out of it. So that was a good deal for, for Emil. Was. Not so good, St. Louis. No, and then the Blues started their decline in the early to mid seventies, and of course the Rangers right. taking advantage of that. And you know, when I think of that time period too, and you and I have discussed it before, but going back to a few weeks ago, where we had the alumni classic for the Warrior for Life Foundation, and we were with Brad Park and with Jean Rattel. And Rod Gilbert. It was a lot of fun to see those guys back together again, right. and. But again, I, when, I, when I think back at the Rangers, of course, I was a Bruins fan because I wasn't complaining. But a end of the season, 1972 slap shot from Dale Rolfe catches Jean Rattel on the ankle. The Bruins yeah. end up winning that in the final series in six games. Uh, and I think the Bruins were a little better. They, I mean, it was just, you know, they had Orr, they had Espo. But nonetheless, they, the Rangers battled hard for six games, but they did that without Jean Rattel, who was really playing the right. best hockey of his life. Right. If they if they had Rattel for that series, they you know, might have won. Um, you know who knows? You know uh, you know they are the Rangers that we're talking about, and the Rangers have uh, grasped a uh, uh, loss out of the jaws of victory many times. Mm-hmm. And um, but um, you know that hurt that that hurt. And you know as you said, the the uh, Bruins had Bobby Orr, Chicago had Bobby Hall. And that's one of the reasons why the Rangers, those Rangers didn't get very far in the playoffs because they just didn't have that that one guy to put them over the edge, you know. Right. Or uh, or 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 uh, Amo wouldn't let that so that player, uh, uh, you know, lead the team as as uh, the other teams did because you know, Red Pop certainly could have uh, you know, been a uh, uh, you know big. Uh, you know, player in the playoffs, but you know the uh, Rangers had a had a team concept, and they they did everything as a team, and um, it just didn't work out for them. As you've noted in your previous book, they did everything but win. That reminds me, the last question on that that subject: being in Madison Square Garden, seeing Brad Park introduced, looking up to the rafters. I'm curious how you feel about uh, Brad being his number two, being retired by uh, the Rangers. Do you think that will happen? Do you think it should happen? Oh, it should, um, and I hope it does. I hope it happens soon. I, I thought they were going to uh, announce it last year when they uh, put uh, Vic Hadfield's number up there. I thought they were going to announce it that weekend you were down there for the uh, alumni game, mm-hmm. 
but um, they didn't, and I don't know why. Um, uh, maybe because you know, actually, Park played more more games for the Bruins than he did for the Rangers. <laughs> but um, but but it's Brad Park. I mean, as um, you know, he was he was our hope. He was our he was the guy who gave us hope. He he came in as a as a young kid, and he he looked young. He had those those ears and a baby face, and he was he he was everything that the Rangers needed. He was a tough defenseman. He could skate. He could score. He could body check at center ice. Um, he was a fantastic player, and it's it's you know really a shame that he hasn't been uh, you know, recognized. People, you know. people forget. I, I posted on Instagram a magazine cover talking about you know, Brad Park talks about how he hates how, why he hates the Bruins. And people forget how ferocious that rivalry was. And you and I talked about it last year. The the ultimate trade, which happened right around this time of year, in November right. of '75. Hard to describe to people how uh, massive, earth shattering. In my my case thinking about it, that trade was seeing, seeing Phil Esposito wearing the Ranger uniform seeing Brad Park and John Rattel wearing the black and gold was uh, took a while to get used to but I, that's uh, a subject we have discussed before but one thing I wanted to talk to you you got some great input on this book you got some great insight from people one of which was John Davidson and he came in to the St. Louis Blues organization uh, a tall goaltender from Western Canada. He is acquired for a variety of players in an excellent trade, but his career is stop and start with the range. A lot of injuries, played right. well when he played, and of course had the, uh, the 1979 final series, but in of course his career post-playing was legendary as well as in, in the media and in, of course now in management. But can you talk a little bit about uh, John Davidson and he, was, he seemed to be really cooperative with you and your book because he really uh, gave you some some great insight on his career. Yeah, he was a he was a you know really good interview. Um, years ago, I published a newsletter called uh, Sports Stat, and I used to send him copies. And one time, I ran into him at the um, in the hallway of the garden. And he he recognized me. He said he reads all my my newsletters and he saves them all. And you know, ever since then, I've kind of had a you know soft spot for JD. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, um, when I was writing this book, I knew I wanted to interview him, and um, I got in touch with um, the PR guy in uh, in uh, Columbus, and. Um, I was able to contact him, and he was actually having back surgery the next week, so he oh. was he was going to be laid up. So he didn't mind, you know, talking to me. And uh, he he really enjoyed his time with the Rangers as a player and um, as you know as a, a broadcaster. And uh, and I'm really happy that he's back as uh, as uh, as a team president because I feel the Rangers are in good hands now. No question, near and dear to my heart is the fact that. He put an early priority on getting the Hartford Wolfpack situation back yeah, under right. control, and that team, as we are doing this interview, has only lost one game so far in the American Hockey League. So, uh, some instant results and some good players coming up to the to the Blue Shirts as well. A couple of other interesting stories that were kind of non goaltending related, I thought were very interesting. You note here before, and I did not know this, so maybe I knew it and forgot, but. The before Hedberg and Nilsson were signed by the Rangers, Sonny Roblin was back on the scene now as president. They had a, a, a deal in place with the soon to be defunct Cleveland Barons to for about a million bucks to uh, pick up Dennis Brooke, Charlie Simmer, and Gilles Malosh. I did not know that. And of yeah. course, that deal was uh, all the league, the league had frozen their assets, and that deal right. uh, was circumvented. Boy. You, did they, you, I just think of that deal. Hedberg and Dilson were fine, but were, uh, but would you see how Charlie Simmer developed? It did some good foresight by the Rangers, by the way. Uh, but looking at Charlie Simmer at that point, because he was kind of a, a non-entity, of course, went on to right, become right. a fifty-goal scorer. Gilles mm -hmm. Malosh, of course, speaks for himself as a goaltender. Uh, Dennis Marouk goes on to score fifty and sixty goals eventually. Boy, I wonder what would have happened if that deal was completed. Yeah, well, that was when when uh, John Ferguson was here as a uh, as a Ranger uh, GM, and uh, Fergie was in the process of building a a good team, 
Um, he he had taken over for Emil Francis in '76 or '77, and um, he he was in the process of uh, of you know, building a, a you know, pretty good team, but he was he was cut off at the knees uh, um, right after the um, the um, the Hedberg uh, Nielsen thing happened. He 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 um, he had the uh, deal in place. And then he was fired, and they brought in Freddie Shiro because um, Werblin wanted uh, names. He wanted, uh, you know, well-known names. Mm -hmm. And Freddie Shiro was one of the well-known names at the time. And uh, the Rangers had to pay um, pay the uh, Flyers for the privilege of signing him. Uh, but if they waited, they they you know would have had him for free because the Flyers wanted to get rid of him anyway. Right. And uh, and. Um, then um, they they brought in uh, Shiro, and the next summer they had a, an uh, elaborate uh, press conference. They put down a sheet, uh, a sheet of ice at the garden, and they had Shiro on the ice with uh, Hedberg and Nielsen. And look what we did. We signed these two guys, and no one said a word about John Ferguson. That right. This was all arranged by John Ferguson. But, you know, that's, that's, that's hockey, you know? Mm-hmm. No question, and of course, Hedberg went on to have a, a nice career at the Rangers. The expectations were very high after his domination of the World Hockey Association. Ulf Nilsson was on his way to an excellent career, too, and he was just plagued by, by injuries and never really got totally on track. He was a point-per-game right. player for the Rangers, but it could, couldn't get a good stretch going. Uh, one other thing you talked about, it was, we're talking about Fred Shiro, with some of the administrative mishaps, and I thought one was kind of humorous. Again, I must have heard the story before, where he makes a deal with Edmonton, and he thinks he's getting Colin Campbell, a defenseman, and ends up getting Cam Connor instead. Mickey Keating yeah. gets his assistant. One year they mix up the, the the training camp situation, so it looked like things were a little, little bit of disarray with Fred Shiro. Yeah, well, Shiro um, had a problem, and. Um you know, I think everyone knows that he he, he liked to drink, and he he liked to uh, have um, his uh, assistant people do the work for him. And um, uh, uh, you know, Mickey Keating, they they say, was just not an NHL capable person, and um, uh, they they just uh, you know that one year they they uh, they failed to book a, a training camp site. They had a train down in uh, Virginia. Um, and um you know you had the Cam Connor fiasco and um and finally um uh Werblin brought in uh, Craig Patrick to to like oversee the operation and um about midway through that season they had a fire shiro cuz the Rangers got off to a very bad start and uh and Patrick took over and he turned the team around and got them into the playoffs that year and he uh actually uh Craig Patrick I think is the only uh, Ranger coach on record that who got his team into the playoffs every year that he coached, but um, he he ended up getting fired at at the end of his at the maybe at the end of six years or seven years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Craig that's, did a yeah, he did a remarkable job too. And his he, I think you noted a lot of the the quality draft picks he brought in. And, oh yeah, uh, sure. Uh, Brian, Brian Leach and Mike Richter, yeah, sure. He was certainly a key role in that '94 team, although he was uh, he was in Pittsburgh and had had already won two cups at, at that point with them. Last uh, at our last show, our most recent show, we've interviewed goaltender Steve Baker, who made a strong contribution to your book as well. When I think of Steve Baker, aside from the fact he's a fellow Massachusetts native, so I always followed his career a little closely, is the fact that the kind of unheralded. 1981 playoff run where the overall fourth-ranked team, Los Angeles Kings, the, were, were the opposition in round one, and round two was the St. Louis Blues, who were the number two team overall that year, and the Rangers dispatched both of them. And what I remember about that series is there's a number of things. You know, Steve, of course, played a key role. Uh, Ulf Nilsson was actually healthy and, and helped push the team along there. But uh, talk a little bit about the... Uh, unlikely 1981 run because the I think the Rangers finished 14th out of 21 teams that year. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was the uh, they they had a lot of small players too. They were called the uh, Smurfs, mm -hmm. and uh, they 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 um, surprised a lot of people. And it's um, 
you know, even their fans, because we didn't, you know, after all those years of losing, you don't really expect much. But um, he he did well. Uh, you know, actually, um, um, he was uh, pretty much in line to become the Rangers' next um, number one goalie, is their next uh, franchise goalie. And um, then he he hurt his groin in. Uh, on Halloween afternoon in uh, in uh, 1981, I was at that game at the Boston Garden. Wow! And um, um, it's a shame because he never really recovered after that. He played a few games for the Rangers. After that, he played mostly in the minor leagues. But it's it's a shame because he he could have been the next Ranger franchise goaltender. And he's a very nice guy when I when I interviewed him. Very nice guy. Yeah, so, uh, nice yeah. guy. Very intelligent. Uh, it's almost it's it's really kind of a emotional father and son moment too he comes home he's in boston his father comes down to the locker room area to check on him and you know he's just you know steve of course is in severe pain one of those things you know we had this discussion with bruce landon who was a goaltender in the king system and you know he's going along well and then he breaks his hand and he then he goes to camp and he can't really catch with his glove he's just kind of knocking things down and he ends up falling out of favor, and you know it's, it's interesting. We, we talk about it a thousand times on the show, but just how fate intervenes sometimes, and in, in, injuries and luck. And if, as you noted, if Steve were able to remain healthy, hey, if John Davidson were able to remain healthy, who knows how things would have changed for for both. But George, I wanted to ask you your own personal. Uh, now you you grew up a, a, a ranger fan i'm obviously appreciating goaltenders but in your lifetime now and you've seen a lot of the greats who do you feel this is really putting you on the spot is the number one goaltender of all time the new york rangers well i grew up as an uh, as an uh, eddie jackman fan and i've i've seen every goal every, every ranger goal is in uh, gump Worsley. and um I would say that the most impressive goalie I've seen has been uh, Lundqvist, Henrik Lundqvist. Mm -hmm. But if I was in the seventh game of the of the uh, of the finals, who would I who would I want in there? Mike Richter, because Richter did it already. He right. he, he he showed that he could do it. Um, he he really didn't have a great career, but he had a great year that year for the Rangers. And um, I would. Put him in there as as my as you know as my guy in, in Game Seven of the Finals if I had to. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, as I said, you know the Rangers have had a lot of good goalies, and some not so good. But um, that's um, that's hockey. Right. You know, speaking of Steve Baker, I'll ask you this other question too. You've noted uh, the masks of the players, and I was curious. Just from a fan standpoint, what was your favorite mask design of the Ranger goaltenders? Well, I like Julius Fillmuller. That was just simple and plain, and it was very uh, iconic. Um, you got uh, Jules Gretan with his lion mask, who he says he got it out of a from a picture in the uh, National Geographic. Yeah, it's really a, he he claims it's a tiger, but everyone calls it a lion. Um, um, uh, Baker had um, had that uh, Empire State Building mask. That was that was very iconic. It's that was um, very memorable. Mm -hmm. And um, you know now with the cages, you don't get that no. uh, that uh, creative as they did back then. And and you know uh, the, you know in the time of uh, Eddie Jackman and stuff, it was just white or gray. It wasn't they you know they didn't paint them that much, but. Um, you know, Jerry Cheeve has had a, had a great mask with all the stitch marks on it. That's for sure. The other thing about back then is that those masks, you can see the mask and know who the guy was. I mean, in other words, the mask right. almost was like the guy's face to a fan right. because you, they were so iconic and so recognizable. Right. It was just like an extension of themselves. But, uh, George, once again, I, I'm sincerely... Uh, complimentary of you for your work with this book it was really interesting if you're a hockey fan Thank you whether, whether you're a ranger fan or a goaltender fan or not it's just a very well researched book you'll find not only the stories about the goaltenders but you also get a real feel for the 
the times that the 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 uh, the, the periods the players played and the stories about the Gilles Looney Gratons and you know Mike Richter's John Van Beesbrook. We haven't even touched on those guys who played wow. later and were fantastic. So again, uh, the the book is available uh, at Amazon.com. Yeah, we'll put links in the show notes for that. And Thank you. and again, George, uh, tremendous job from beginning to end, from the design to the content. Uh, again, to the uh, like I said, the, the research and the the homework. Not an easy job, but well worth it. And thanks again for the, writing the book and for being with us again here on the show. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. This week in Boston Bruins history, November 26, 1975, Bobby Orr plays his final game as a Boston Bruin in a 6-4 win at Madison Square Garden over the New York Rangers. He records a goal and an assist despite noticeably limping, according to Boston Globe writer Fran Rosa. Bruins defenseman Brad Park, who was recently acquired from the New York Rangers, was booed lustily on his return to Madison Square Garden. And finally, Jean Rattel, also a newcomer from the Rangers, returned to the Bruins lineup after a brief one-game walkout and scores a goal in his first game as a visitor to MSG. This week in Whalers history, November 26, 1977, the New England Whalers at the Birmingham Bulls Thanksgiving evening. And on this Thanksgiving night, New England Whalers coach Harry Neal, angered as Bulls fans threw ice, beer, and debris at Whalers players, invaded the crowd and began swinging a hockey stick at the drunken Dixie spectators. Neal was eventually restrained by the police. The next day, the police questioned Neal, and after an interrogation, he jumped into a cab, screamed, quote, get me out of here, to the driver, and a $120 fare later, arrived safely in Atlanta, Georgia. Two Alabama State Troopers were stationed behind the visiting team's bench at the next game in Birmingham. And in this week in WHA history, Thanksgiving night, 1977. Now on Thanksgiving evening in 77, I was in Worcester, Massachusetts at my home. And we had Thanksgiving dinner that day, and naturally I'd be looking for a game to watch or listen to that night, and I came across, as I often did, WLW, the 50,000-watt station in Cincinnati, which broadcast the games of the WHA Cincinnati Stingers, clear signal, and was looking forward to a game that night with between the Stingers and the Birmingham Bulls. Now, the Bulls had just jettisoned skilled players like Tim Sheehy and Vaclav Dedemanski and replaced them with goons like Killer Hansen and Steve Durbano. I tuned in early as Stingers broadcaster Andy Mac Williams recited the opening lineups. I sensed something big was about to happen. What followed was an incredible scene of hockey mayhem and brutality. The WHA would never be the same. Here's an excerpt from the book Rebel League. On Thanksgiving Day, 1977, the Stingers traveled to Birmingham, where Glenn Sonmore had just required Dave Hansen and Steve Durbano in a trade with the Detroit Red Wings and had recalled Frank Beaton from the minors. The Bulls' starting lineup that night featured Durbano, Beaton, Serge Baudouin, Gilles Bad News Bildo, and Bob Stevenson. The Stingers counted with Robbie Fatorik, Del Hall, Jamie Hislop, Ron Plum, and Barry Legg. If you can guess where this is going, congratulate yourself, congratulate yourself on the grasp of the obvious. 20 seconds into the game, a line brawl started. The five Stinger players had the same chances. Five pygmies in an elephant stampede. Baudouin started pounding on the 5, 10, 160 pound for Torque. Bilodeau squared off against Hislop, who wasn't much bigger than for Torque, and totaled all 17 penalty minutes that season. Durbano battled Plum, who never accumulated more than 66 penalty minutes in any of his eight professional seasons. After peace had been restored, however, referee Peter Moffat incredibly gave the Stingers the extra penalties, and Rick Dudley went ballistic. Stingers coach Jacques Demers threw sticks on the ice and 
tried to get at Bulls GM Gilles Leger. After the game, Demers was still livid. Quote, this proves to me that Glenn Son Moore is not a hockey man. I put live hockey players on the ice. He put out goons. Said Barry Melrose, the thing I'll always remember about that night is they had this minister come out and say a prayer before the game. He's at center ice going, quote, and God please protect these players and deliver them from harm and watch over them, end of quote. And the minute they drop the puck, the war breaks out. Duds went crazy that game, and after that, we changed the look of our team. And the Stingers did indeed change the look of the team dramatically, and it was a real shame. So gone quickly thereafter with players like Richie LeDuc and Blaine Stout, both 50 goal scorers the year before, along with Dennis Sobchak. And in their place came Alf Handrahan, Bruce Gregg, our old friend Paul Stewart, and Willie Trogadets, who had just been suspended for life for an incident in the International Hockey League. And as you know, the WHA never really recovered from that, and certainly the Stingers franchise never recovered from that either. In closing the show, I wanted to note the passing of Bill McCreary Sr., who died on November 25, 2019. During his pro career, McCreary played for the New York Rangers, Detroit Red Wings, Montreal Canadiens, and the St. Louis Blues. He later coached the Vancouver Canucks for the first half of the 73-74 season and then became general manager of the California Golden Seals in 1974-75. Although the Seals were performing fairly well, a dispute with coach Marshall Johnston led to his firing of Johnston and going behind the bench himself for the remainder of the season. He hired Jack Evans as coach the following year, but the team moved to Cleveland and became the Cleveland Barons. The club struggled, and McCreary was let go as a general manager. Bill was the older brother of Keith McCreary, also an NFL NHL left winger. His son, Bill McCreary Jr., played 12 games in the NHL with the Toronto Maple Leafs during the 80-81 season. Rest in peace, Bill McCreary. And finally, I'm going to conclude the show with a random Hartford Whalers goal from November 20, 1990. Hartford at Boston with Chuck Caton at their microphone. They had to make the Bruins pay on two majors. Now Denis for Francis Every becoming the line. He just missed the net with a snap shot up the right side. Young to rebound. Still 50 seconds remaining in the Carter major being served by Hodge. Here's Verbeek to the point to Crossman. Back to Verbeek. Into the middle, they're young on left point. There's he's right, he scores! The Whalers are getting the bounces! That puck seemed to hit Ron Francis out in front! And the Whalers take the lead in electrifying fashion at 11.51 on a deflection out in front of a left point drive by Young! Thanks for listening to the Pro Hockey Alumni Podcast, the voice of hockey legends. Just a reminder to please consider giving the show a rating and or review on Apple Podcasts. The link is in the show notes. These ratings and reviews help us become a lot more visible and make the show more accessible to hockey fans everywhere. I personally read all the reviews and greatly appreciate them all. If you have thoughts or suggestions for the show, you can talk to, contact us through our website at prohockeyalumni.org or be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at Pro Hockey Alumni. Thanks for listening.